Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this Overseas webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Hopefully, you can hear myself and Robert uh, and see us okay uh, wherever you're joining us from. My name is Sebastian Bampton, and I'm account manager at Your Overseas Home. Today, uh, I'll be chatting to, to Robert, Robert Webb from Chase Buchanan about the financial considerations you should think about when buying over in Portugal. It's great to have you all uh, with us today, uh, whether you're with us live or catching up on demand. Delighted to be able to help you realise your dream of owning a property overseas in Portugal. Today's session will be a maximum of 30 minutes. And for those of you listening in live, uh, there will be an opportunity at the end to put your questions to the expert, Robert. Um, if you do wish to ask anything, please type your query into, and or your question into the right hand side, side of the screen on the questions tab. Um, if you do remember, well, if you do need a reminder of anything that we've discussed today, or you'd like to share it with perhaps a friend or family member, uh, a replay will also be available on your overseas home website to watch at your own leisure. Uh, so yeah, enough from me. Let's get started. Um, so over to you, Robert. If you wouldn't mind uh, sort of introducing yourself, giving us a quick summary uh, as to who you are and how Chase Buchanan can help our listeners today. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everybody. A warm welcome. Um, I hope you're going to enjoy this. Uh, I'm going to cover quite a lot of ground. Um, basically, principles and issues that you face when moving to, to Portugal, both as an EU national and non-EU national. Then I'm going to deal with uh, some taxation issues, uh, non-habitual residents, golden visas, and then finally some tax planning ideas. So. Don't worry, um, there's going to be quite a lot uh, of content, but if you want the slides afterwards, um, no problem at all. Just, just, just drop me a line. So really, on that, I'm going to kick it off. Um, right, here we go. Right, um, first slide uh, we have, this gives you the corporate structure of Chase Buchanan. Uh, we've been going for about uh, 20 years now. Um, we have offices in many countries, both in the EU and outside the EU. But the important bit is the regulation. Um, we are regulated by uh, CISEC, which is the Cyprus uh, regulatory body um, for investments. That's the MIFID passport. And for insurance, that's the IDD passport. Uh, this is quite common now, basically pre-Brexit, it used to be uh, UK registration, but everybody's come out of there now, uh, basically because EU advisors can no longer advise in, in Europe. So a lot of people like ourselves have gone to Cyprus. Uh, but we are still registered in the UK, um, and that provides a, a great deal of comfort. Um, we also have um, a tax uh, contact, uh, in the Isle of Man uh, for various issues. But another important kind of uh, factor is that we are also regulated, fully regulated in America. Um, very few advisors have got that. So if there are any Americans watching, uh, we can help you. Right, okay, uh, this is just a little bit uh, of background. If you can see it, um, it just shows you where we have our offices, uh, Spain, uh, Belgium, Canada, Portugal, obviously, USA. Uh, we're also uh, in, in Malta. Uh, so we are very widely spread. Um, we've got about uh, 15, 20 advisors, full backup, full admin people. So you need have no worry about solidity uh, at all. Right. The, our services basically are those of a traditional UK IFA. Um, so in other words, we deal with pensions, we deal with investments, portfolio management, financial planning. There's, there's no rocket science in that. Um, those are very standard um, features that most IFAs would have. Right. So the first category um, would affect people who are EU nationals moving to Portugal. So EU nationals, that's obvious. So that's Irish people, uh, French, Germans, whoever. And this is easy, so easy. You don't need a visa. You've got total freedom of movement. 
Uh, Ireland, you actually do need uh, six months left on your passport. But the whole point is you, you can come down here, no visa. But you have to register if you want to be permanent. You have to register after 90 days stay. Uh, you get a registration certificate from immigration, which is called CEF. You have a fiscal number, which is a, a tax number. You need to show sufficient funds for retirement. And that is not a, a great deal, as you will see later. You don't have to purchase a property. You do need um, to get into the healthcare system here, if you wish. You can also have an S1, which you can get from your own country, which basically means that your own country, so France, Germany, wherever, would pay for healthcare here in, in Portugal. The uh, stay the certificate is valid for five years. Absolutely perfect. It's very, very simple. Right, now we move on to that not so simple stuff, which is the non-EU nationals. Okay, hang on, something's gone wrong here. Wait a minute. Yes, here we are. Right, now this goes into various stages. It does become a bit tiresome with all the paperwork, believe you me. But the first thing is you can take advantage of Schengen rules. So you can come down here uh, as, as a UK resident, um, South African, American, Australian, whoever, you can come down here. You don't need a visa for 90 days. Okay. Very, very simple. During those 90 days, if you wish, um, you can um, contact your state agents. You can start looking at properties. If you are serious and committed about moving, you'll need to get a NIF number, which is which is an income tax number here in Portugal. You will also need to get a bank account, okay? Relatively easy to get, um, but you would really need um, a lawyer or preferably a lawyer or um, an agent to get you the NIF and the bank account. Very simple. Next stage is you would, um, uh, sorry, right, okay, sorry, 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 got to go back here, sorry. You trying to go back, Robert? Yeah, I'm trying to go back, sorry, That's here we right. go. Which way oh, this one? Yeah, okay, yeah. right. So once, once you've got your NIF in your bank account, uh, you put your own property uh, on the market, and then you have to apply for either a D2, or D7 entry visa, okay? It's a two-stage process. The first is to get an entry visa. Now, you get that in your country of residence. So in the UK, you pop along to the Portuguese consulate in uh, Manchester or London, and you apply for the visa, okay? The... Critical things there really are, are a health cover. You will need health insurance. The visa lasts for 120 days, okay? So once you get that, you're, you're, you're up and away. No problems at all. You can then visit down here for 120 days, and then you can move on to the next stage. Then once you've done that, um, you can then um, make an offer on a, a Portuguese property if you wish. Okay. You'll need a lawyer for that. Um, we can provide you with, with details of that as well. Next stage um, is obviously to arrive in Portugal. Now, this then would still be with your entry visa. But when you get here, you will then need to apply for the residence permit, okay? Now, for that, you need to show a minimum income requirement. And for a couple, that's only 12,690 euros. It, it's really not a great deal. Um, so once you can show that, uh, 
you then need to register with the local tax authority, financiers. You then also need to register with the National Health. You can, if, this is where it gets a little bit tricky, you can, if you wish, get your own health insurance. It's not compulsory. Um, some people may feel it's, it's better to have it. Some may not. But it's entirely voluntary. You do not have to have your own health insurance. As I said earlier, you can get um, an S1. Now, that for, for Brits, you would apply uh, to your home country to get this. And basically, what it would mean is that the UK um, authorities would pay for healthcare costs incurred down here in Portugal. Okay, and as I said earlier, it's also um, relevant and, and possible for other nationalities. So French, Germans, Italians, you can get an S1, which would enable your relevant government to, to pay for the, um, cost, the health costs down here. It's quite a big subject. It, it's quite um, controversial in a way. So in other words, is it better to have private health care or is it better to be in the public health? The consensus is that for day-to-day -day appointments, consultations, minor details, minor um, consultations, stuff like that, it's probably best to get private health care because waiting lists are really poor in, in the um, in the national system but for major major expenditure items big operations allegedly apparently the public health the national health does provide a better service but it's all a little bit trial and error okay so the other one issue to consider for non-eu nationals instead of the D2 or the D7 is a golden visa. Okay, now there are numbers of ways of getting the golden visa, but the one I focus on is property. Basically, if, if you purchase a property outside the coastal areas uh, of up to 500,000, you will be eligible for a golden visa. That 500,000 can come down in, in various stages. Uh, to 400, to 350, to 280. It, in a way, um, it, it's quite reflective of the way things work here in Portugal. Um, it's a little bit heavy, it's a little bit long-winded, but you do have the choice. Okay, so all you need then, obviously, once you've made your, your purchase, the application can go ahead. You need your ID, so in other words, your, your passport, you need a bank account, you need a fiscal number. You apply to, to CEF, again, the immigration uh, department. Probably take up to three, four months, maybe a little bit more. It's quite a long, drawn-out process. But the, the benefits to you, really, are that you only need to be in Portugal for seven days in, in any tax year, okay? That's quite attractive to a lot of people um so it's really a very much a, a, an individual thing uh you've also got family reunification so in other words the golden visa will cover a uh, spouse and children okay so it's well worth it the other one of the other features you get of course is that um you've got freedom of movement within the schengen area and another really quite important point to go with the D2s and the D7s is that after five years, you can apply for um, Portuguese passport and Portuguese citizenship. That could be quite useful for a lot of people, um, particularly for UK people with inheritance tax. And I'll come on to that at a later stage. So golden visas, quite simple. Now, non-habitual residents. Now, this has got nothing to do with living residents or non-residents. It's just a tax status. 
So in other words, non-habitual means you haven't been here before. That's really what it means. But here's the critical point, a really good point. Non-habitual residence is available to EU nationals and non-EU nationals, okay? So if you've got a D2 or a D7 and you're just coming in here to um, retire, you can get non-habitual residence. So it's a quite important factor, this. But there are just a couple of inquiry, uh, <laughs> a couple of requirements. You must not have lived in Portugal in the previous five years. You must not have had NHR status before. And you have actually lived in Portugal for 183 days. Now, 183 days is basically a residence qualification. So to get tax residency, you need to be in Portugal for 183 days. Now, that's either in the tax year, which is January to December, or it can stretch over two calendar years. So if, if you are, let's say, coming down in, say, September, September, October, November, and that, then you carry on into the following year, that 183 days would then make you a uh, tax resident in that following year. Okay, it's very simple. Right, so again, the same types of um, documents are needed. Um, fiscal number, which you can get quite easily, as I've said before. Proof of address, you need to register with the uh, Portuguese tax authority. It, it really is quite simple. But here's the, uh, here's the advantage. The status lasts for 10 years, okay, 10 years. Now, what that benefits you is that pensions derived from outside Portugal are only taxed at 10% for 10 years. Now, that's quite a significant concession and one well worth grabbing. Dividends, uh, interest, royalties derived from outside Portugal are taxed at nil. So you can see that, that is a very favorable tax position and one you really should jump on because, going on to the next slide, where are we? Uh, where are we? No, 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 no. no it's not moving. Was oh, it, dear. Which uh, slide are you after, Robert? Is it the. Uh, what? No, next one. That's it. Right. No, no. Go back one. Sorry. Go, that was oh. it. Right. <laughs> if you don't have NHR, you will be taxed at normal rates. And income tax in Portugal starts at 14 and then is banded right up to 48 percent so the issue is do you want to go to ordinary rates or do you want to go to nhr absolute no-brainer if you are eligible for it which most people are you must really go for nhr there are exceptions but it is the primary factor the primary source to look at capital gains tax down here is at 28 percent that's um, quite chunky um about the same as the uk really but still quite chunky but again next point no wealth tax absolutely not at all perfect there is property tax on uh, property um values at over 1.2 million euros uh, in respect of joint ownership. But again, the actual rates are not excessive. VAT, um, that varies according to the actual item from 6 to 23%. Inheritance tax, there is no inheritance tax in Portugal. Okay, but I'll explain a little bit later. That's not the end of it. Now, inheritance tax would largely apply to uh, UK individuals, but there would be no Portuguese inheritance tax, but very likely there would be 
UK inheritance tax. So it's one to uh, take on board. Okay. Right. Right. Financial and tax planning. Now, these are just a few ideas um, that uh, you need to consider. Right. The first is, as I said earlier, UK financial advisors, independent financial advisors, are unable to advise clients in EU countries anymore. So if you're coming down here from um, to Birmingham or Reading or wherever it is with your IFA in, the, in those places, he or she will no longer be able to advise you in Portugal once you become resident. UK pensions. Now, um, the issue here is the tax-free cash. You can take 25% of the fund in the UK tax-free. So if you've got 100,000 in your pot, you can take out 25,000 tax-free in the UK. But it's not tax-free down here in Portugal, okay? So the critical thing, obviously, is to consider taking that lump sum before you get down here. There's no point in paying tax unnecessarily. So this is just one thing to consider. Um, also, you might want to consider you know, transferring a UK pension um, to an international SIP or a QROP. That's that's worth a seminar in its own right, and it'll take forever to go through it. But it's just a box. It's something to, to, to think about. UK ISAs. If you've got a UK ISA, unless it's in cash, a cash ISA, it's taxed here in Portugal at 28%. So if you've got um, unit trusts in there or you've got stocks and shares and they make a gain and you're resident in Portugal, you're going to have to pay tax at 28% not the best uk investment bonds now by and large they are effectively tax-free um in uh the uk but they are not tax-free in portugal okay not tax-free in portugal right uk property now this is one that often confuses people if you have a property that you're renting out in the UK or you're selling it and, and making a gain, tax is payable in the UK. So you pay income tax on the rent and you pay capital gains tax on the sale, even if you are or when you become Portugal resident. So all property taxed in the UK. Don't forget that. Irish pensions. Now, this is amazing. If you have what is called an ARF, which is, let's say, it is a pension income. If you have an ARF uh, from an Irish pension and you're resident down here, you have to pay Irish tax on that pension. It's a very complicated subject. And my opinion for what it's worth is that if you are coming down here with an Irish pension, think about moving it out before you get here. Do not automatically go for the ARF. It's not the best idea. Uh, state pensions uh, in the UK, Ireland, totally unaffected. They're all paid gross. So you don't have to worry about anything like that. Now, Portuguese compliant investment bonds. Now, these are very tax efficient vehicles uh, based on Portuguese tax laws. That's why they're called compliant. They comply with Portuguese tax laws and they get very favorable tax treatment. So there's no capital gains tax to pay on the growth in your bond. Remember earlier, Taxes at 28% on stocks and shares. Within the bond, nothing. But the beautiful thing is withdrawals, let's say stroke income that you take from the bond. If you have NHR, here's the good news. If you have NHR, 
the tax is only 10% for 10 years, or even if you don't have NHR, you still get very favorable tax rates. It, it's easily the best vehicle to use down here to get tax efficient growth and income. UK inheritance tax. Now, this again is a massive subject. It's another topic I could spend a lot of time on. The, without going into all the ins and outs of it, for British, for Brits coming down here, it's almost certain that they are still going to be liable for UK inheritance tax. And in my opinion, for at least five years after arrival. OK, so don't get on the plane and take off and land in Faro or, and Lisbon and think you're out of IHT inheritance tax. Almost certainly you're not. OK, I can advise on that. Um, it's a very difficult, complicated subject. It looks easy, but believe you me, it isn't. The tax starts at £325,000 and it's 40% on any excess over there, over, over that. And very simply, if you just think about property values in the UK, how many houses are worth £325,000? Thousands. So 325 is not a big amount of money. Right. Um, coming to the end now. Paperwork down here, to be blunt, is very tedious. It's very tiresome and there's a ton of it. And of course, it's all in Portuguese. So you really must get agents. You must get lawyers. You must get accountants to work for you. Otherwise, you're going to be pulling out all your hair and you're going to have none left in a very short period of time. It's a very big point. We obviously work with lawyers and accountants who can help you with that. Um, figures that I've given, um, they're just for um, examples, um, but any financial planning or help or advice that you need, you know, we're more than happy to give it. And finally, these are my details. So as I said earlier, if um, you would like a copy of these slides, then please uh, just get in touch with me, drop me a line, drop me an email, and I'll send them on to you and answer any other further questions or points that you may have. So I think that's about it for me. And uh, oh, blimey. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've run over a little bit. Uh, sorry about that. But um, I hope I've covered a lot of ground here, and I hope a lot of it made sense. So please do get in touch if there's anything you're not certain about. Thank you for your time. Brilliant, Robert. Yeah, thank you very much as well. That was a yeah, very comprehensive overview. Uh, I know there's a lot of, of stuff to cover, and it is uh, inevitable that we were sort of going to run over time. But that, you know, that's really, uh, really sorry. useful. <laughs> it happens, it happens, Robert. But uh, yeah, we have, we have quite a few uh, questions that have come through um, from the clients that join us, guys. So thank you very much for uh, yeah. you know, typing your questions. We'll try and get around to as many as possible. Um, there have been a couple, Robert, that have been related to the fee and D7 visa. And there's one here from Adam Darnley um, asking if you're able to offer an affordable one of these property without the D2 or D7 visa. Sorry, say that again. Are you able to offer an Portuguese property without a D2 or D7 visa? Uh, yeah, I think you can. Yeah. Um, you can. Whether you do that or not, that that's uh, obviously to say down to you. But Getting the D7, which is for most people, it does take a bit of time um, and you're going to need it eventually, I would say. Okay, fantastic. Um, and I suppose you touched on it right at the end. I know it's quite a complex um, part of the process. Um, in regards to I suppose, the inheritance tax, I mean, what advice could you give quite quickly, I suppose, and quite concise on you know, the best ways to, to really ensure that you're not getting taxed or overly taxed on inheritance? Oh, it's such a big <laughs> subject. Um, there are, I think what I would say is, the assumption, if, if you're what is called a UK domicile, you are liable to inheritance tax. Uh, domicile you get from your father at birth. So if you were born in the UK, father was UK national, you are a UK domicile. I always liken it to be a badge. 
So you carry it with you wherever you go. So if you move from the UK to, to Portugal, you're still a UK domicile. You're still liable. If you move to Spain, you are still a UK domicile. You can you lose residency, change residency easily, but you can't change domicile. So if you are still a UK domicile, you're liable. There are a few plans available, which in my opinion are absolutely fantastic uh, to avoid the tax. Everything will depend on commitment, uh, how serious you take inheritance tax. It is a long process to avoid it, but it can be done. Okay. Right, brilliant, Robert. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, and we've got, just got a question through here um, from Paolo asking us to talk about how much uh, taxes you need to pay if you buy a Portuguese property as an investment. Um, what would you pay in taxes as a non-resident generating a Portuguese rental income? Uh, income, you, right. If you're a non-resident, yeah, you would still be taxed on the marginal rates, whatever that is, okay? you It's a quite specialist area. You would need to see an accountant for that. And we, we've got two or three who, who will gladly help. That That is a very specialist uh, area. Okay. okay, all right, Ben Robert, and yes, say if you, we, you would like to be put in touch with the specialist, Paolo, please do get in touch um, after this webinar with us. Uh, I've got a question here from Peter. Uh, he said, can you buy a property and then take residency later? Uh, he's a UK citizen who's buying residence in Switzerland. Yes, I think you can. Again, uh, that's a bit of a specialist area. Uh, I would have, to be honest, I'd have to consult one of my contacts on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to do. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Do get in touch with us for the, for the small specialised questions. Um, and finally, Robert, if you could just wrap up and, and summarise um, why people I suppose, should seek uh, professional uh, financial advice and when they move to Portugal and when is probably the best point in the process to actually get in touch uh, with yourself. Right. I would say two things about this. Imagine the UK to be a box, OK? You've got both feet in the UK box. Now, if you come to Portugal, you need to get into the Portugal box. And a lot of people don't do that. They still tr relate everything to the UK. So ideally, of course, you need a foot in the UK box and you need a foot in the Portugal box. It takes you quite a bit of time to get your head around it because of the different tax rates, the different structures, the language, Everything is different. So what I would say is you've got to have an open mind. You've got to go with the flow. There's no good, there's no point coming down here and thinking everything is the same as it was in the UK. It won't work. The second thing I would say is if you are coming down here and you're, you've got, say, tax issues with capital gains tax, ISAs, investment bonds, pensions in the UK, blah, 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 blah. Get hold of us before, well before you get down here so that we can kind of give you some pointers, give you some ideas as to the best direction to take. It's like everything else, early planning, as soon and as possible, the earlier the better. Brilliant. Yeah, Robert, I could say I couldn't agree more. Um, so the more time you have, uh, for this you know a complex uh, journey of buying property overseas i think you know, it's all, always going to be beneficial um but yeah you know thank you um i think that's all about you know all we have time for today um okay Robert, but yeah it's been very insightful and you know there's great tips uh, and other sort of advice throughout we do obviously strongly recommend and as robert mentioned today you do get in touch with you know Kate and and it directly and as early as possible within the, the process to discuss your individual requirements in, in more detail um, and yeah thank you to all the viewers um, for watching this session whether or not you're watching live on demand um, we wish you all the best with your, your move overseas um, we do also have um, various other resources available to, to help you on your buying journey including buying guides and other webinar recordings um, so do take, take a look at our website and yeah thanks again uh, Robert and thanks for everyone that joined no, and, yeah, happy 
No, well, thanks to you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for organizing it. And thank you for everybody who's uh, been listening. I hope you found it useful. And I say, don't forget, you know, if you need anything, it doesn't matter how silly or how trivial you think it is, please get in touch. No problems at all. Happy to help. Brilliant. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Robert. And yeah, we'll, we'll speak soon. Okay, that's brilliant. Okay, good to see you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.